Hi, everybody. I'm Jeff Mayers from WestPolitics.com. Welcome to another one of our virtual events. We would usually do these at the Masson Club, but uh, because of what's going on with the coronavirus, we're doing this uh, virtually. So I want to thank our sponsors for this event series. Couldn't do it without you. Hush Blackwell, American Family Insurance, Walmart, XL Energy, ARP Wisconsin, and the Wisconsin Hospital Association. <coughs> Thank you, sponsors. And for all of those who are in the mm -hmm. webinar, um, you can submit questions via the chat format at the bottom of your screen. So now I want to welcome in Congressman Brian Stile. He's a Republican from Janesville. Welcome, Congressman. How are you today? Jeff, thanks for having me on. Good to see you. Yeah, so uh, Congressman, uh, you are in Janesville, right? I'm in my uh, Janesville office uh, downtown on Main Street, so welcome. <laughs> Went through Janesville the other day. It's looking good. So, um, you know, let's just start with, uh, you know, um, when we first set this up, the coronavirus was uh, everything, and now uh, it's uh, in some ways taking a backseat to uh, the uh, death of George Floyd, uh, other uh, uh, police uh, uh, shootings around the country, Black Lives Matter. And so there's a, uh, a, a bill on police reform that's up in the Senate uh, this week, and then the House is going to take up a measure. So I'm wondering, um, how do you see things unfolding this week in Congress on, the, on this important matter? So I think everybody uh, has taken this as a moment to realize that there's always opportunities to make us a stronger uh, union. And I think looking at the opportunities to continue uh, to do that, in particular, as it involves police reform, is positive. Uh, I think there's a lot of things, uh, both in the Senate bill and in the House bill, uh, that I like a lot. One in particular is making sure that we're providing uh, resources to local law enforcement agencies to continue to improve their training regimen. I've been on the phone uh, over the past handful of weeks uh, with uh, leaders in our law enforcement community, as well as leaders uh, in the African American community, here in Southeast Wisconsin, and I hear kind of unanimous support on uh, the opportunity uh, to continue to improve uh, and work on training. Uh, there's areas that are gonna be more controversial uh, in the bills as well, in particular as it relates to no-knock warrants. Uh, I've been on the phone, uh, in particular, with a lot of our law enforcement community on where the, there are specific instances uh, where that is appropriate. Uh, we're gonna find out what the final version of the House bill looks like. Uh, came out committee last week. Um, whether or not there will be uh, any amendments brought on the floor, uh, but I'm continuing that dialogue with my colleagues. I do think ultimately between the Senate version and the House version, probably 85% of it uh, is broadly supported, uh, Democrats and Republicans, maybe 90% or more. Uh, I'm optimistic that we're gonna be able to set partisanship aside uh, and be able to actually move forward uh, in support of improving uh, law enforcement, making sure that those men and women uh, who wear the badge to protect us uh, have the resources that they need uh, and the training that they need to be able to do that uh, in the, at the level of professionalism uh, that they often show uh, and that I think we all require of our, of our police force. Okay, so you, you're thinking that something's <laughs> going to pass Congress. It's not all going to pass Congress this week because there's probably going to be a conference committee. Is that, is that basically that the might, process? The, the, that's how it looks like. That doesn't mean that that couldn't change between now and the end of the week. And so I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful and I'm pushing that I think there's an opportunity to negotiate this in advance of it coming to the floor. What very, what very likely could occur is a Senate version and a House version uh, could have, in the big picture, minor differences uh, on specific issues, in particular no-knock warrants. Uh, if that happens, it'll require a conference. Uh, my hope is that that could be resolved then reasonably quickly. Uh, we could get a bill that is then uniform uh, and it has a lot of the reforms that I think are broadly supported uh, across the ideological spectrum. Okay, so you mentioned no knock warrants a couple of times. So you're opposed to that, I take it. Well, I, I think so. In the in the in the you're opposed to banning. You're opposed to banning no knock warrants. I take it. In in outright ban, uh, which is the current version of the House bill, uh, I think is is a step too fast, too far. I think what we need to do is understand how they're currently being used and then what are the particulars. And so some jurisdictions uh, in my conversations uh, with the law enforcement community actually I think have a really good checks and balance system as to when they're absolutely necessary being used as a last resort 
uh, to make sure that we're not putting uh, officers' lives in jeopardy uh, when not required. Uh, other jurisdictions may not uh, be following such a regimented regime uh, that we have, uh, in particular here in Wisconsin. I think we do a very good job at that. Uh, but I think the, the step too far uh, might be this House version uh, where it's an outright ban out of the gates. But again, we'll see what this final version looks like by the time it's actually brought to the floor on whether or not there'll be amendments allowed uh, on the floor. Okay, so you're saying that a lot of police departments do it, do it well, so why, um, why interfere with that? But how do you make sure that all the police departments don't overdo it with the no-knock one? No. Ab absolutely the right question. And so this is an area from a federal level uh, that really just hasn't been thoroughly studied previously. I mean, often, uh, and in best cases, law enforcement's responsible to the communities that they serve. And so from a federal level perspective, my understanding, uh, to the best of my knowledge, is there's never really been a federal study or review of the process for no-knock warrants. So it's a jurisdiction by jurisdiction basis. And what we want it to be is a last resort, but there are instances uh, where the risk to officers' lives uh, is very significant. Uh, and removing that tool without any form of study or analysis, I think, uh, is a bit reactionary and may put uh, officers' lives at risk, at risk uh, and is a, is a real serious concern. Okay, now uh, another one of the bans that is proposed in the House bill, I think, is the ban on chokeholds, police chokeholds. And what's your view on that? Every, everybody that I've talked to in the law enforcement community, uh, as well as the African American community, broadly speaking, supports a, a ban on chokeholds. I, I, my understanding is most jurisdictions in Wisconsin, uh, that's already uh, codified in their rules. Uh, I don't know of a jurisdiction in, in our state uh, that would allow that. Um, whether or not we need to ban that outright, I don't have a problem with that. I think it's just going to be in the in the detail as to how that's done. I mean, I don't think that um, that's a, a necessary uh, tactic. I haven't even spoken to uh, one law enforcement officer uh, that's indicated that that's a, a necessary tool in their toolkit. Uh, and so I don't see any reason why we would need to have it. But I think some of that is going to be more of a, a statement because in jurisdictions like Wisconsin, to my understanding at, at each jurisdiction, that, that it is currently uh, not in use. Now, what about this issue of... Um the police, uh, law enforcement being funded too well, having too much uh, militarized, uh, uh, military style equipment and all that. Does, will the bill address that or should it address that? Yeah, I, our, our law enforcement, I think is still best served when decisions are made at the local level. Um, and so I, what I don't wanna see us do is nationalize our police force with a one size fits all approach. I mean, New York City is very different than Milwaukee. Milwaukee is different than Elkhorn, Wisconsin. Um, and so the one size fits all approach may, is, is really not the appropriate uh, way for us to do this. I do think there's a need to make sure that our, our law enforcement community has the resources uh, to do their job. And out of the, the hundreds of thousands of men and women uh, that wear the badge to defend our communities, the, the vast, vast majority uh, do that honorably and are there for the right reason. And we, but we do need to make sure that they have the resources uh, to do their job. And often uh, we're asking these men and women uh, to put their lives on the line and to go into harm's way. Uh, and I think there's often situations where it's appropriate to make sure that they have uh, the resources that they need to be able to conduct their job. Okay, what about this issue though, maybe you can speak to it even if it's not in the bill, about whether some uh, money in the police department should be shifted to more social services. Since some of these um, um, you know, terrible things that uh, have occurred have occurred to people who really weren't committing um, a violent crime at, at the beginning of the incident, you know, uh, uh, then a scuffle ensued and then uh, somebody gets shot. So, I mean, what about the idea that maybe the police shouldn't be the first responders to that kind of person anyway, that there'd be more money set aside for uh, social services or mental health uh, workers to be the first people to approach? Well, let me be clear, I don't support defunding the police, uh, but I do think there's an appropriate need in particular to address mental health. It's one of the things uh, that I put at the forefront of things that I've worked on in my first two years uh, in office. I think that's in particularly important mental health uh, across the board. Uh, we've done seminars uh, down here in Southeast Wisconsin. I did one at uh, Racine High School, maybe now about a year ago, uh, talking about how Racine is a leader in bringing in mental health training directly into the high school. We brought together 
uh, experts from the Racine Unified School District as well as Children's Hospital uh, and other experts in the field to talk about opportunities to bring uh, mental health education directly into the high schools. Uh, we've talked about this uh, work that I've done uh, last year during the appropriations process to increase funding uh, for veterans mental health, uh, mm -hmm. to make sure uh, that veterans have the resources that they need uh, as it relates to mental health. Uh, you know, you talk to a lot of men and women that have served in uniform uh, for the United States military, um, and many of them uh, aren't comfortable or don't want to go and receive treatment at the VA. Uh, we've seen opportunities for telemedicine uh, where that breaks some of that stigma for some of these individuals. Mm -hmm. I'm fully supportive of making sure that we're providing uh, mental health resources across the board. Uh, but I wouldn't confuse that uh, with some of these calls uh, to defund police, which I do not support. It, it, it sometimes depends on how you define what defunding is. I mean, uh, taking away all money or diverting some of the resources. But at any rate, is the bill going to be involved? Uh, does the bill, will, do you think one of the bills will be uh, addressing, either the Senate or House bill will be addressing this part of it, this part of the debate? I, I think it's going to be less focused on that and more focused on uh, most of the, the, the tactics and the tools that police use. I do think we need a broader conversation in our society, uh, as well as in, uh, in, in Washington, in the House and in the Senate, uh, about how we are getting uh, individuals the mental health resources uh, that they need. Again, most of that's going to be implemented uh, at the local level. For example, Racine Unified School District is a great place uh, to bring those uh, resources to bear directly uh, to students who are in our community uh, who do need that assistance so that these problems don't spiral uh, further out of control. We get the resources and assistance uh, early on and have preventative measures. Uh, a lot of this is going to be locally driven, but I do think there is a need uh, for a broader societal conversation uh, about the role that mental health plays uh, in the strength of our society. Okay, well, uh, let's move on. Maybe uh, we, I'm sure some of the audience questions may uh, um, come back to police reform. But on the coronavirus response, both health and uh, economic response by the federal government, and I would include the Federal Reserve in, in that. Well, how would you rate the federal response so far to, um, to the coronavirus epidemic? Well, we, we need to step back and, and analyze the fact that this has never occurred before. And so Congress, Washington, uh, is building the ship as we paddle out to sea. And so there's a lot of duct tape on this. This isn't some sort of a well-built uh, machine, but it is definitely floating. And so you got to take pride uh, that we're keeping things uh, above water, uh, but recognizing that when you're building a ship as you paddle out to sea, uh, you're using duct tape and we're just keeping ourselves afloat. What does that mean? So if you go back and you look at one piece of the, the four major pieces of legislation that have moved through the House, the Paycheck Protection Program uh, has saved uh, millions of jobs across the United States. It has kept intact the employer-employee relationship, uh, which is so critical, in particular when you have conversations with macroeconomists, understanding that when you keep the employer and the employee relationship intact, your ability to recover from this recessionary period that we entered and to be able to return out of that quickly uh, is essential. Were there hiccups inside the PPP? Absolutely. Did it require additional reforms? Absolutely. Uh, but at the same time, if you look at which the speed in which Congress acted, the thoughtfulness of bringing in not just the SBA to fund this, which is kind of the old idle loan program structure, but instead to effectively deputize every FDIC uh, insured institution, effectively every bank in the United States of America, to be able to go out and push liquidity into the market, I think we saved uh, millions and millions of jobs. And as a result, uh, our recovery uh, will be much quicker than if we did not do that. But that said, uh, this is a challenging time and we are building the ship as we paddle out to sea. Uh, and by no means uh, has it been perfect, but overall, I think it's, uh, it's been pretty darn well done. All right, well, is there a need for, I forget whether you, we're in phase four of the response or phase three. Is it, what's the next phase? What, what more needs to be done and when does it need to be done? The great, great question. What, what I look at as it relates to this is we entered this, um, it, we'll, we'll call it four pieces, but really it was like three and then 3.2, right? So 
if you look at the pieces of legislation that have come through, it was kind of a sledgehammer approach in the CARES Act where roughly $2 trillion of funding uh, was put forward. The total amount of funding is roughly $2.9 trillion of funding. That's kind of the sledgehammer. Now what we need to do is shift from the sledgehammer and move to the scalpel. So we came in with a flood of liquidity from Washington to keep businesses afloat, to keep people's jobs intact, to make sure that we were plussing, to make sure that we were providing people's access uh, to unemployment insurance. Now we need to shift from that phase into a more nuanced approach to make sure that we're getting relief to where it's required, making sure that we're providing uh, per personal protective equipment to nurses and doctors on the front line, to make sure we're driving forward with research to ultimately to a cure, a vaccine, uh, and a treatment. Uh, but what we need to pull away from is the sledgehammer approach where relief was broad-based, which was appropriate out of the gates uh, to make sure that the, you know, our economy stayed afloat. But now we need to shift and have a much more nuanced and thoughtful uh, approach going forward versus what we're seeing, for example, uh, in the, the more recently passed uh, House bill uh, that will not become law, but the House bill that was passed was an additional $3 trillion of spending. That's, the, that's continuing on with the sledgehammer of federal spending where there's a grab bag of things, regardless of whether or not that relief was particularly needed in a specific instance. And I think we're going to see this broader dialogue about broad-based government spending approach where people are inserting policy objectives uh, that are not directly tied to coronavirus on one side uh, with a more nuanced, uh, detail-driven approach that's more respectful of taxpayer dollars that's specific to the relief that's required uh, in our country. Okay, specifically though, what didn't you like in the, the bill that the House Dems passed? Well, we, I mean, we get, we go... Yeah, well, you could you could go down a laundry list. So you could you could look at the uh, the increase of the six hundred dollar plus up uh, for unemployment insurance that would extend till January twenty twenty one, way beyond people's ability uh, to predict what our economy will look like uh, late into the fall and early into the winter. Uh, we could look at the total dollar amount being three trillion dollars uh, if that was signed into law. Uh, that would take the federal government spending uh, as it relates to coronavirus to $5.9 trillion. Uh, and that's on top of the traditional federal spending and on top of what the Federal Reserve is doing and plussing up uh, their balance sheet. In, and then inside there, it had things uh, that were policy objectives that were not specifically related to coronavirus. Uh, an example of that is effectively a Washington, D.C. takeover uh, of our voting system. Wisconsin has one of the strongest uh, voting systems uh, in the nation is evidenced uh, by our high voter participation rates. We want Wisconsin to control uh, how Wisconsin votes, make sure that we get everyone access uh, to vote. What we don't need is a Washington, D.C. approach. And that's where inside that bill, there were policy objectives not related to coronavirus, massive amounts of spending and broad-based kind of sledgehammer approaches rather than coming in uh, with a more nuanced uh, in scalpel approach to providing relief to where it's required. Okay, so uh, the you didn't agree with the extending the unemployment uh, into the fall and into uh, um, into the uh, early winter. What about is there a necess is there a need for another um, check um, for all taxpayers? I, again, I, I think we need to shift away from broad based. Uh, spending approaches into a much more nuanced approach. And so out of the first round, where every individual received $1,200, an additional $500 for a dependent child, uh, with max outs at income of $75,000 for an individual, $150,000 uh, for a married couple, that was regardless of anyone's uh, economic situation as it relates to their impact uh, from coronavirus. That was a broad-based approach. Uh, out of the gates. There's reasons to do that is you have multiple states mandating effective, complete, complete economic uh, shutdown, maybe slightly overstated there for effect. But in, a, in, a, in part, the state governments are coming in and shutting down economies uh, across the country. There's a reason you need to push in uh, aggressive amounts of liquidity. We're now past that phase. We now need to shift away from the broad-based approach 
and get relief to where it's needed. Those individuals who've fallen on hard times through no fault of their own due to coronavirus, make sure those individuals have the ability to pay their rent, pay their mortgage, cover their grocery bill. That, to me, is very different than sending checks uh, across the board to everyone, knowing uh, that we're in a situation where we're bringing on debt. And so the question that every member of Congress should be asking themselves is, is this action uh, justified to borrow that money uh, effectively from China? And so if you look at our national debt, we came into this year a little north of $23 trillion in debt. Uh, we've now crossed $25 trillion in debt. Uh, when you talk to uh, the, the economists who are analyzing where we'll be at the end of the year, it'd be very reasonable to say that we will be somewhere between 27 and $28 trillion in debt uh, by the end of the year. Uh, if the, the Democratic proposal went through, would be most likely north of $30 trillion in debt. Uh, it sounds like funny money, but somebody uh, is going to be on the hook for this. And this is all of us uh, participating in today's call. Uh, and future generations in the United States of America, we're going to be called on uh, to ultimately uh, repay this debt. What about more money for state and local government services? Um, should state and local governments... Uh, you know, they're going to take a hit probably on, on property taxes and, and uh, local taxes. Um, should, uh, should they have more money available from the feds? Uh, so, so let me break the answer on, on this into, into two parts. So one, $150 billion uh, was allocated to state and local governments to provide assistance uh, at the beginning of this pandemic under the CARES Act. Wisconsin received roughly $2.25 billion dollars uh, for them to generally spend as they want uh, as it relates to the coronavirus pandemic. Governor Evers is in the process of determining how those funds will be allocated here in Wisconsin. And so the push for additional funding, I think, is, is significantly premature before we analyze how the funds that have been allocated and particular funds that have been allocated and not spent are being spent not only in Wisconsin, but across the country. The second part uh, that I think is really important as it relates to your question is no one in Wisconsin should be on the hook uh, for terrible fiscal policies in other states like Illinois. So you have some states uh, that made tough decisions to balance the books, and Wisconsin did that uh, in, the, in the previous 10 years, uh, starting with the reforms put forward by Governor Walker and the State Assembly and the State Senate, tough decisions, but got ourselves a balanced budget. Other states did not make those tough decisions. And so in the context where some individuals are advocating uh, for state government bailouts, I think it would be, it's completely inappropriate to tell Wisconsin taxpayers uh, that they should be on the hook uh, for other states' poor fiscal management. So how is the first district faring? Um, you know, your constituents and uh, businesses and the uh, local governments there. So I, I, was, I was once told that, that anything can look good or bad when it's, when it's relative. And so I look at Southeast Wisconsin, these are really challenging times. And so it'd be hard to say uh, that anything is going well when you see the unemployment rates uh, that we have, you see how many people uh, are struggling across the board. In a comparative sense, uh, Southeast Wisconsin is performing reasonably well. Uh, we continue to uh, see businesses that are interested in coming into Southeast Wisconsin and setting up operations many of them uh, looking to exit uh, Illinois. Uh, Wisconsin, uh, across the board, in particular Southeast Wisconsin, uh, has a heavy concentration of manufacturing. One of the things I think we're looking at uh, from this broader pandemic that we've experienced is a lot of large companies are looking to bring onshore uh, their manufacturing operations and make sure that their supply chain is domestic. That's positive uh, here in the state of Wisconsin, where multiple companies that I've spoken with uh, are, are planning to uh, move operations uh, closer to home. I think there's a real opportunity, uh, in particular, as it relates to the pharmaceutical industry, uh, where we've all been made aware of the significant complications that they have in their supply chain, our dependence on production abroad, in particular in China. And I think Southeast Wisconsin is, is shockingly well positioned. Uh, to allow those manufacturers to set up shop and operation in our state uh, with U.S., Wisconsin-based employees uh, running those operations uh, to the benefit not only of our local economy uh, in, the, in the medium and long term, uh, but also to our nation's uh, stability to make sure that our key 
uh, medical resources are domestically produced. Okay, so uh, Foxconn uh, is in your district and uh, it's, uh, it's going to be making uh, ventilators for Medtronic, I think. Uh, and so what's the status of the, of the Foxconn um, um, vision as I guess we, we knew it under when your predecessor, Paul Ryan and, and uh, Governor Scott Walker uh, helped make that happen. Is, is, is it going to live up to the promise? So the, the information that I have on Foxconn is the same information that's publicly available uh, to everybody else. And so my understanding is they have roughly 600 people currently uh, working at, on location uh, today. Um, and that's, a, that's 600 more jobs uh, than were there a couple of years ago. And that's, that's great and positive news. From the federal perspective, uh, I'm focused in on putting in place policies that encourage all businesses uh, to come uh, and open up domestically and in particular across uh, Southeast Wisconsin. So I'm less focused in on any one given business, uh, but very focused in, in making sure that we have, say, a competitive international tax structure uh, in place at the federal level that's encouraging businesses to come to Wisconsin, to open up operations, to hire uh, what really is the greatest workforce uh, in the entire world that we have right here in Wisconsin. Right. But yeah, well, I don't want to get too deep into the, the, the subsidy uh, question, but, um, you know, there uh, subsidies help bring Foxconn into Wisconsin. So should, are subsidies something that uh, the feds or government should use to help businesses uh, during times like this? Well, so maybe, maybe two, two different pieces there. So the, the federal government has not in any way uh, subsidized uh, the operations of Foxconn or, or, or any other no, that was a business. State. That, that's a, it's a state level. Uh, process. And so I don't support the federal government engaging or getting involved uh, in providing subsidies to, to onshore uh, businesses in the United States. I think we have a lot of opportunity uh, to do that through natural business forces. And I think those are occurring right now as businesses analyze uh, their supply chain and the risk that they have uh, by having foreign operations. I think many of them will find uh, that market forces will encourage them uh, to bring their operations uh, onshore, which will be to the benefit of the U.S. economy uh, across the board. Specifically, though, is, the, is there ever a role for the federal government? As in particular, as you look at the Paycheck Protection Program, uh, I do think there are instances where we, it was appropriate for the federal government during the, the period of the coronavirus uh, to engage and get involved. And the real, the real focus of that uh, is not to, not to support the business, it's to support the workers and to make sure that those workers were tied to their job through some of the most challenging times any of our small businesses uh, across the United States and in Wisconsin face. Uh, and I think overall that program showed great success at keeping that employer-employee relationship uh, intact. And so I just wanna make sure we're differentiating yeah. between the two in that answer. No, no. no you're right. That was a state, state subsidy for, uh, for Foxconn. Well, okay, I guess I was gonna try to lead into, you know, there's been talk ever since, uh, uh, President Trump took office about uh, that the parties could unite on a giant infrastructure bill that would, you know, uh, prime the pump uh, for, you know, uh, a lot of work that needed to be done and also help, uh, you know, uh, certain parts of the workforce. Would, th would this be a good time to do a big infrastructure bill? And could have passed. So, so the, the, I, I think the second question is going to be the more, more challenging, could it pass? Big infrastructure bills beyond what is traditionally done uh, in, in, its, in its regular order in Congress, to me, occur when the other side of the ledger reaches agreement. What do I mean by that? There's full agreement, I think, from almost everybody I talk to on the need uh, to improve our infrastructure. We can have small debates uh, as to what that means. Is it roads and bridges? Do we also include rural broadband? Do school buildings count in this, right? We could, we could, you know, airports, we could have that conversation. But across the board, I think there's universal agreement on the need uh, to make sure that we're protected, that we're investing uh, in our infrastructure. The other side of the ledger doesn't have that same uh, level of, a, of agreement. And so when you go back and you saw uh, you know, Pelosi and Schumer and others uh, say that we were going to spend $2 trillion on infrastructure, that was the agreement on, on the one side of the ledger that says, here's what our needs are. There's not yet a, a consensus even being discussed as to how we pay for that, right? Is it general purpose revenue? 
right? Is it user fees? Is it, you know, is it um, uh, cutting spending elsewhere? And that's the type of conversation that's going to ultimately be required uh, for us to have and get our hands around uh, a broader infrastructure package uh, in the short term. There's always opportunity uh, for that to come together uh, in short order, uh, but I struggle to see that materializing between now and the end of the year. That's what I call a big infrastructure package. That said, I do think that there's an opportunity uh, for uh, the, the more standard uh, transportation, transportation infrastructure package uh, to come forward before the House and get passed uh, between now uh, and the election. Sorry, I muted myself. Right, I got to get this down. Okay, we, we weren't going to get through a Zoom without one of us doing. Yeah, that. Uh, well, okay. I I am happy to be the one who screwed up here. Okay, anyway, so uh, I want to move on to before we go to audience questions about um, ask you about your you used to be a UW regent and uh, and the UW system has been going through uh, quite a lot because of the coronavirus, declining enrollments even before that. Uh, and, and mergers, and now uh, there was a failed uh, process to uh, pick a, a uh, new president, but uh, now Tommy Thompson is the interim. Is that going to turn out okay? I think that's great news. Uh, when I saw that on uh, Friday morning, uh, I put out a tweet and, uh, and, and gave uh, Governor Thompson a, a call. He is uh, a reformer, and if you look at what's needed right now, in higher education, it's big, bold reforms. And I don't think there's anybody uh, better suited uh, than that than Governor Tommy Thompson to take the helm uh, during what is probably one of the most challenging periods of, of time we've seen uh, for higher education uh, that, that I can think of. And so knowing that big, bold reforms are gonna be required to protect the system, uh, which is one of the greatest assets we have uh, in the state of Wisconsin, uh, I was very excited. I think he's the, the right man for the job, uh, and I think he's going to do a, a tremendous job uh, guiding this forward. The proof's going to be in the pudding here, uh, but I think his background at having bold reforms, at being a champion uh, for education uh, across the state of Wisconsin, uh, positions him really well to be able to lead the University of Wisconsin system going forward. Okay, well, we're going to go to some audience questions, and then I'll come back and ask you a question uh, at the end. So here is, this is a comment, not a question, but you, I think you should respond to this. So the, the question, quoting exactly here, so what are poor people supposed to do without federal assistance with millions of people still unemployed? You are so wrong. Well, so, so maybe, maybe there's a bit of confusion uh, as to, as to w where there's assistance for folks that are unemployed. So the, the current unemployment system is, is still intact. And so what uh, the CARES Act did is it took unemployment plus $600 a week uh, out, of the, out of the gates in the short term. And so that's created some real challenges uh, in, our, in our employment structure as people have the opportunity to return back to work uh, safely and healthy. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we need to continue uh, the broader increase uh, that's created a lot of this economic challenge. We ultimately don't want to incentivize people to not work when there's jobs that are available for them to return to. And so that doesn't mean removing unemployment insurance. And so maybe that we should be really clear on that. Unemployment insurance is there for people who've fallen on tough times. And we've seen millions and millions of people uh, who have lost their jobs, who've fallen on tough times, and it is absolutely appropriate to ensure uh, that we have a safety net uh, that's available for those individuals uh, to make sure that they're able to, to cover their rent, pay their mortgage, and cover their grocery bill. I think that's distinct and different uh, from the broad uh, increases uh, in the dollar amount for unemployment insurance that in many cases uh, provided a, a funding level in excess of what an individual would be able to make before, uh, during uh, their, their work in the private sector, or going forward as businesses are beginning uh, to reopen and are struggling to find individuals. Uh, and the federal government's interaction in the labor market has caused uh, some real significant uh, challenges uh, as states, uh, in particular Wisconsin, are looking to get back up operational and running. All right, here's another question. Uh, when we finally get out of this pandemic, do you foresee cutbacks or 
to earn benefits such as Social Security or Medicare in order to offset all this extra spending, you know, the deficit spending of which you uh, talked about? Uh, short answer is no. I think what we need to do uh, is make sure that we are protecting Social Security and Medicare in particular uh, for our seniors and those approaching uh, retirement age. I mean, those are promises that were made uh, to seniors. Those are promises that need to be kept. Uh, I do think it's appropriate to continue to identify the significant debt load uh, that the United States has taken on um, and put forward a path to sustainability. And that's going to require everyone coming together to have that conversation about how we ultimately uh, turn the ship and get this back. I think we can do that and protect uh, the benefits of Social Security and Medicare, uh, which seniors and everyone has paid into, and make sure that that promise uh, is there, uh, not only for those currently relying on the programs, uh, and, but those for future generations, and in particular, those approaching retirement age. So one questioner here also asked about the tax cuts passed uh, um, uh, under uh, your, your predecessor uh, and how those drove up the deficit and establish a cap on deducting state and local taxes. Is that, was this, is that part of the problem with the deficit? What, 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 what we've seen right now is a, is a massive uh, recessionary environment. And so if, if, as we saw at the start of the year before coronavirus, uh, we had one of the strongest economies uh, we had seen in a generation. Not only uh, were um, our tax revenues increasing, uh, but we also saw uh, record uh, levels of employment, uh, not only across the board, but also in key demographic groups. We saw one of the lowest unemployment rates for African Americans, for Hispanics, uh, for women, for veterans. Uh, that was really positive. And so you got to put in place core economic policies, tax code policies that make U.S. businesses competitive internationally, that that has a direct ramification on the economic growth that we saw uh, coming into this pandemic, as well as the employment situation that was allowing many people for the first time to get back up on their feet and into the economy. We, that doesn't mean we didn't have room to go, but that's the position that we were in entering the pandemic. Now we've had significant economic downturn during this period of the pandemic. The last thing I think we should do is raise rates uh, on, on businesses and on individuals uh, who are struggling to get out of uh, this downturn and get their businesses back up and operational and bring people back into the workforce. And so I think Washington has a spending problem, uh, not a taxing problem. And I think it's going to be essential uh, that we put forward pro-growth policies uh, that get people back to work, back up on our feet uh, is the number one focus uh, for us going forward. All right, there's several questions here on, on voting, uh, voting in Wisconsin, voting, absentee voting, voting by mail. Um, I guess uh, one of the questions is, I'll just, I think it summarizes it. What are you doing to ensure that everyone who wants to vote by mail can vote by mail in November? Great question. I was actually on a radio show in Janesville, Wisconsin on WCLO. I was talking about my grandma voting uh, earlier this morning. And so Wisconsin has, uh, an outstanding election process. And so what I'm doing is making sure Washington doesn't get in the way of how Wisconsin uh, operates our elections. And so I think what's really gonna be important here, uh, heading into uh, the fall and, and the, the, the August primary uh, for those that have races, is making sure that everyone understands all the ways that you can vote in the state of Wisconsin. So there's three key ways you can do it. You can vote by absentee. Wisconsin has a system that requires no excuse, meaning Anybody that wants to vote absentee can go ahead uh, and vote absentee. I think we should protect that right. Uh, I was on my earlier uh, radio interview, I was saying that's actually how my grandma voted uh, in the spring, right? She's of, of, of an age where it wouldn't be appropriate uh, for her maybe to be out. So that's an opportunity. Two, you can vote in person early. And so I'm a Janesville guy. You can go down to City Hall uh, in Janesville uh, in the weeks leading up to the election. You can request a ballot, you can fill it out, you can hand it back in. Uh, in person. And then third, uh, as we all know, you have the ability on election day uh, to go to your local polling place uh, and to vote in person. I think we're going to see a lot of people, uh, and I've seen different models as to what percentage this will be, uh, but a lot of people uh, choose the option of voting early uh, by absentee. That's great. I think people's voices uh, should be heard. I think we should encourage everyone 
uh, to exercise uh, their right to vote, to make sure their voice is heard this fall. This is a big election coming up. Uh, but what we need to do is make sure uh, that individuals are educated and understand all the options of how they're able uh, to vote. We need to remove a lot of the confusion that we saw coming into uh, the spring election, uh, where that, that opportunity <clears throat> to educate the population of all the options that Wisconsin provides uh, was somewhat missed. Uh, but if we inform people uh, about their options about how to vote, if we protect the ability to make sure that people have options to vote, I think what you're going to see is Wisconsin continue to be a national leader in voter turnout. Uh, my recollection in 2018 is Wisconsin had the second highest uh, voter participation rate uh, in the nation. We could, I could look that up uh, by the end of this call. Somebody can probably correct me if I'm wrong on that. But I believe we were the second highest in the nation. I'd like to see us be number one in the nation uh, and make sure that we get out uh, the vote across the board so everyone's voice uh, is heard uh, this November. Should the federal government help uh, Wisconsin local governments and the state government um, uh, ensure the mail-in process uh, you know, works more smoothly or is available to everyone? When the, when the federal government gets involved, usually they muck things up. And so Wisconsin, again, I think does an outstanding job uh, at the local level uh, implementing our elections and the proof in the pudding uh, is that we are very, if I think we're, we're, the, we're usually in the top couple of voter participation uh, percentages in the nation. Again, the, the number second uh, in the 2018 election comes to mind. We can, we can check that uh, on the exact number. But the proof in the pudding is Wisconsin voter participation is a national leader. I think what we should be doing is sharing what we're doing with other states uh, who do have opportunities to improve their process. If the federal government gets involved, uh, I think there's a real risk that we'll go to the lowest common denominator uh, across the nation. I think Wisconsin's a leader in this. I think we should remain uh, that way. I think we should even work harder to encourage more people uh, to vote and have their voices heard. Uh, but I don't think bringing uh, federal government uh, into Wisconsin uh, to control our election system is a step forward. If anything, I'd be very concerned uh, that that would be a step backwards considering we're such a leader uh, in voter participation here in Wisconsin. So you would consider though no, federal appropriations designed to help do that, help absentee ballot, uh, absentee ballot initiatives, uh, absentee ballot uh, um, uh, use by, by uh, citizens to be too much intrusion by the feds. Is that what you're saying? I've been in office for 18 months, and I can tell you every time I've ever seen Washington, D.C. spend money uh, and send it to states and local governments, they will attach rules and regulations, uh, some of which may be positive, a lot of which will be negative. And so Wisconsin has a, a good system that's operational today. I think as you begin to federalize our election system, uh, I think you put at risk uh, what is actually a really strong uh, and functional uh, election system that we have here in Wisconsin. I think we there's room for improvement. I'm open to anybody's suggestions at the state level as to how we can continue to improve participation in our election system. Uh, but I think it's really important that we all appreciate that Wisconsin has one of the greatest systems in the nation. Uh, we should be looking as to how we can share those best practices with other states uh, rather than looking for the federal government to come in uh, and provide rules and regulations that I think uh, could very likely uh, be detrimental to the high voter participation uh, that we have here in Wisconsin. Okay, here's a question from somebody um, who says, um, as the co-chair of the Future of Work Caucus, what are your thoughts on how the coronavirus legacy on the future of work, work from home, et cetera, is it really going to change the way business does business? I really think it will, actually. Uh, I, I co-chair that with a, a Democratic congresswoman from uh, Delaware, Lisa Blunt Rochester. Uh, and we're actually uh, scheduled to have a, uh, a caucus meeting on Zoom tomorrow. I encourage anybody on this call uh, to join us tomorrow when we have that call. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunities that we've learned. I mean, how many people on this call uh, knew what Zoom was uh, four months ago? Uh, I can't see everybody, but if you raise your hand, right? I mean, a small number of people, and we probably all wish, you know, we were, uh, we own the company. And you look at what's occurred, we've realized uh, through this period of time that there are ways that we can leverage technology uh, in our opportunities to become more effective 
uh, and more efficient on delivering our work products. And so an example of this uh, would be if you just look at my specific office, I have you know, 16 people on my team split between multiple offices, one in Washington, DC, uh, as well as uh, across Southeast Wisconsin in Janesville and Racine in Kenosha. I operated in the private sector before uh, and put in place uh, contingency plans in case there was a business interruption. So when I arrived in Congress, I put in place uh, a very similar plan in case there was a, a national interruption. I was more thinking in the context of anthrax uh, or thinking in the context of a terrorism. I did not predict a global pandemic. Uh, but because we had that in place, we just flipped a switch. And so my whole team, the, literally the next day, uh, everybody was operational working from home. Everybody had the ability uh, to utilize the phone line. So if, if you or anyone else called our office on any day, uh, from the day before the pandemic to the day after and still to today, all four phones, uh, you can call the Kenosha office, you can call the Racine office, you can call Jamesley, you can call Washington, D.C. Somebody will pick up the phone. Uh, we have VoIP phones, are able to transfer those calls between us. Uh, there's moments where it's a little bit clunky on the backside, but from the user experience, they don't see uh, that difference. And so we've been able to uh, provide great resources uh, to constituents uh, who've fallen on pretty darn challenging times. Uh, over the past uh, three months, there was an instance uh, where an individual, a gentleman was trapped in Peru. I don't know if you recall this, but Peru uh, shut all their borders with effectively no notice. And they just one day you woke up and Peru said, nobody's allowed in, nobody's allowed out of the country. And there was a gentleman uh, from Southeast Wisconsin in the first congressional district uh, who was in Peru, who had a pretty serious medical condition. Uh, and his wife called uh, our office and said, is there any way we can help get this guy out? Uh, you know, he, she just called the main line, which was great. And we were able to answer it, triage it. Uh, I was on the phone uh, with the State Department. I was on the phone uh, with the head of the, uh, the embassy in uh, Lima, Peru, who was coordinating this operation. Uh, this guy actually had a, had a heart condition and he had medication for the duration of his trip plus a couple days. Uh, and he got down where he was running out of medication and ultimately uh, we were able to get him evacuated a day after uh, his medication ran out, get him back to the United States, get him back on uh, his medication. And so we're able to do that leveraging technology. And so Lisa Blunt Rochester and I, the future of work, started this pre-pandemic with the thought of there's a lot of technology kind of coming down the pipeline. And there's two things you can do. You can stick your head in the sand and be fearful of change and hope that somehow it passes you by. Or two, you can lean in and you can find opportunities to work more productively, to leverage that technology, to allow American jobs to take advantage of it, uh, to increase wages. Uh, and the two of us have been working together. And I think we're going to come out of this. Uh, and it's going to be it's going to be a challenge as we get through this. But I think as we come back out on the other side, a lot of U.S. businesses are going to find new approaches to leveraging technology uh, to improve their business operations going forward to allow uh, for higher value work, which also ultimately uh, drives wages higher. And so I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an optimist uh, that this is going to ultimately bring us uh, to a more competitive uh, global uh, work environment where the United States has a leg up because uh, we're going to continue to uh, advance the use of technology uh, going forward. Yeah, when you talk, first started talking about Peru, I thought you were going to be talking about Aaron Rodgers, trying to get Aaron Rodgers back in the country. But anyway, this was a, a, a constituent of yours, so that, that was nice of you to do that. Aaron Rodgers, you, that'd be Mike Gallagher. He's probably calling Mike Gallagher. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, if the Packers um, want to move to Kenosha, I'll chat about it. <laughs> okay, so um, you've only been in Congress since 2019, elected in 2018. So uh, there's a, several questions here about partisanship or how can there be less partisanship because I think a lot of what we see when you're back in Wisconsin is you know an utterly broken institution is it broken how do you bridge the the, the partisanship from your end the, 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 the biggest challenge that I see in Washington is how ingrained the partisanship has become I'll, I'll give you a, a story to exemplify this so as you noted, I won election in 2018. I've been in office 18 months. Uh, you, you win election, it's Tuesday night, you're absolutely exhausted, you get home, you finally do laundry because you haven't done it for the past two months. And you realize you're going out to Washington DC that next Monday, 
uh, for effectively onboarding for new members of Congress, like HR onboarding that any company would have except it's in Washington, D.C. And so you fly out to Washington on Monday. You know, you've, you've seen some of these faces, but you've never met any of these people before. And everybody stays at the same hotel, a Courtyard Marriott, about a half a mile from the Capitol. And you get in Monday night and you, you go to bed, you're exhausted. You get up in the morning and you ride the elevator down. And there's 90 members, 60 Democrats, 30 Republicans. We're all going to the Capitol to receive, receive the same briefing on the same topic for the same job. And you, you come out of the elevator and you walk out the front door and there's two buses, one for Democrats, one for Republicans. And you think to yourself, in what world does this possibly exist? And it, to me, that exemplifies how the partisanship has been ingrained. That doesn't mean we're all going to sing Kumbaya tomorrow and that we're all going to hold hands and solve every problem that we're facing. I'm not trying to be Pollyannish about this. There's reasons where Democrats and Republicans will agree and disagree. I think that we should you know, lower taxes and encourage growth. Other people think we should raise taxes. That's a fine partisan divide uh, to have. But what we don't need to do is allow everything to become partisan because some things aren't partisan in nature. We see, you know, how do we uh, provide care and resources for veterans uh, who've served our country? You know, some of these big challenges where we let partisanship get in the way, we do a disservice uh, to people, uh, not only um, in Washington on trying to get stuff done, but we do a disservice to, to everybody that sent us there, Democrats and Republicans alike. And so one of the things that I spent time on uh, in my first uh, year and a half here, two years, is spending time building these relationships uh, across the aisle. And I do that because ultimately to tackle some of these, the biggest things in front of us is gonna require some of this back and forth to find the ultimate solution. No one has a monopoly on good ideas. And so in the business side where I came from, uh, when I had a big deal to strike uh, with somebody on the other side, the first thing I would do uh, is go out to dinner and get to know the person and then sit down and begin a drawn out negotiation, right? I might want to buy a hundred widgets for, for, you know, $10 and they want to sell a hundred widgets for $1,000. And so now we begin this negotiation about how are we going to get to an agreement where both sides walk away uh, in, a, in a positive light. In Washington, we start off where both sides start against each other uh, with this ingrained partisanship and it's very unproductive. Uh, and I think there's a real opportunity uh, to change the tone and to begin to build these relationships, which over time, uh, I think will will kind of lower the temperature and allow us to address some of the biggest challenges uh, that we face. Okay, there's a, there's a theme in some of the questions, which is going to lead me then to ask a final question because we're kind of up against the clock. So a lot of the questions are, why doesn't the congressman... Uh, criticize President Trump for X outrageous remark. Why don't you? I mean, my, my view is let's talk about the policies. And so I think the policies that are being put forward uh, are quite productive. I'd go back and look at uh, what was NAFTA, which is now USMCA. I think we're making great progress uh, across the board. Now we've been uh, punched in the face uh, through the coronavirus and where our economy uh, is in very challenging times. But I'm focused in on my role uh, of making sure that we're advancing policies that are to the benefit of not only everybody here in Southeast Wisconsin, uh, but across uh, the country. And so my time and energy uh, is spent focused in on policies about performing here for people in Southeast Wisconsin that sent me to Washington, not chiming in on everything that's trending on Twitter uh, on every given day. I don't find that to be uh, an effective and productive uh, use of time. But you support the president's reelection this uh, November. Yeah, I, th I think it's going to be a clear distinction between the, the path that the president will take us and the path that uh, Joe Biden uh, would take us uh, from a policy perspective. Uh, if Joe Biden was elected into office and Nancy Pelosi has the speaker's gavel, uh, I think we would have a really challenging uh, economic future in the United States of America. I just look at the three trillion dollar bill uh, that the House of Representatives uh, passed. Uh, something like that would be signed into law if uh, Joe Biden was president. Uh, and that would be, I think, catastrophic uh, for generations in the United States if we change the trajectory uh, of our economy. And I think in particular at a period of time uh, where we are so challenged economically, when so many people have fallen on hard times, uh, the path ahead to me uh, is going to be required to be investing uh, in our growth, uh, in our economy and jobs, 
getting people back up on their feet uh, into the workforce and ultimately uh, returning to the economic strength that we had uh, in the United States prior to uh, the global pandemic. Okay, so uh, both uh, President Trump and Vice President Pence are going to be in Wisconsin this week. Um, one's an official event with uh, President Trump on Thursday at a shipbuilder uh, on the uh, East Coast, and then uh, and and uh, Vice President Pence is going to be uh, here uh, tomorrow. So, what's that tell you? You know uh, Wisconsin's tip of the spear, and I think it's great uh, that we're going to have both the president and the vice president uh, in the state of Wisconsin in the same week. I, I don't know. I don't have the stats as to how often that's ever occurred uh, in any of the 50 states, but my guess is that's not a common occurrence. Uh, I think it tells you a lot about uh, the importance of Wisconsin uh, nationally, and I think it's great uh, that they're coming. President Trump is going to champion uh, the, the investment that we've made in the United States military. Uh, over the, the past three and a half years uh, that strength in the military allows us to negotiate uh, from a position of strength. Uh, my understanding is Vice President Pence is going to be uh, at a charter school in uh, Waukesha tomorrow. I'm, I'm hopeful that I'll uh, be there with him to talk about uh, the importance of education, about preparing workers uh, for the jobs of the future, uh, about the role uh, that school choice has played to help so many uh, in the state of Wisconsin receive the best education uh, that they can, regardless of uh, the zip code they were born in, regardless of the color of their skin. Uh, I think it's a great story about how conservative policies uh, have helped uh, our country and have helped Wisconsin. And I'm excited they're coming uh, here to our state to champion those issues. Yeah, so, you know, the, the, the polling's uh, looking bad for Trump right now versus Biden in, in Wisconsin and other states and nationally. So, um, you know, your parts of your district are, um, pretty swing areas like Kenosha, you know, parts of Janesville. Um, what's your sense from your constituents about how this election is going to go in November? Uh, yeah, I, I'm focused. Uh, the, the election will be in November. It's not, it's not today. And so I think right now uh, we're beginning this process of laying out the framework. I mean, from a campaign standpoint, a lot of this has been really on hold uh, as we face the most challenging issues in front of us. Uh, obviously, the pandemic uh, and then some of the broader uh, social unrest that we saw following a horrific uh, murder in Minneapolis. And so I think what we're going to see is a compressed election cycle, uh, things that might not actually be too bad to have a compressed election cycle. Uh, most of the TVs in Wisconsin are pretty free of political ads right now. That's going to change probably pretty darn soon uh, as we approach uh, four months to the election. Uh, and so I think we're going to have a, a shortened election cycle. And that's the time, uh, an appropriate time for candidates uh, to make their case as to why they should uh, be elected. And so we're at the very beginning of this. Uh, I'm not concerned about what any of the polling data says today. Um, I think that the proof is going to be in the pudding when people look uh, at the choice on the table as to what policies they want to see implemented uh, going forward. I think people are going to say they want to return to the economic strength uh, that the United States had uh, prior to the pandemic, uh, that they don't want to uh, look and lean more on Washington uh, to provide uh, for us. We want to be up and on our feet and we want pro-growth policies in place that allow us to do that. All right. Well, I think we, uh, we got in a full hour, Congressman. Thanks very much for taking the time. Really appreciate it. Uh, hope that someday we'll do one of these things in person, either in D.C. or, or Madison. Thank you. I love it. And, um, I want to thank our sponsors for uh, being part of this Madison Club series. Um, and the sponsors are the Wisconsin Hospital Association, ARP Wisconsin, Walmart, XL Energy, American Family Insurance, and Hush Blackwell. So I want to thank the congressman. I want to thank all of you. If you have ideas for future events, please let us know. We have uh, one with the Milwaukee Press Club with uh, U.S. Senator Ron Johnson uh, this Friday. Um, and um, the recordings you can find at wispolitics.com. So this is Jeff Mayer signing off for today. Thank you very much.